Last time we looked at the effect of tidal forces on close orbiting planetary systems, like two Earths orbiting right next to each other. Incredibly, these kinds of worlds can exist according to physics, but so far we haven't found any evidence of them. The closest orbiting moon or planet that we've seen yet is Phobos, which is the larger of Mars's two moons. Phobos's orbit is only 6,000 kilometers or 37,000 miles from the surface of Mars, and makes one rotation of the planet every seven and a half hours, and this means that it rises and sets three times in the sky every Martian day. However, Phobos's orbit is not stable, and it will crash into the Martian surface or break up into a planetary ring in perhaps 43 million years. With NASA aiming to get to Mars in the 2030s, there's been some discussion of landing the first crew on the moons, as it would be much less difficult and require less fuel, so we could get to land on Phobos before Mars itself. One site that's been suggested for landing by a Canadian mission is the so-called Phobos monolith, a feature near Stickney Crater. This massive piece of rock is about 85 meters across, and our best guess is that it's a piece of impact ejector, that's a plume of rock pushed outwards when Phobos was hit by an asteroid perhaps the one that created the Stickney Crater itself. So here's a real-time view of Phobos from the surface of Mars looking up, and you can see the stars racing behind it, uh, and that's an indication of the rapidity with which Phobos moves around on its orbit. From the surface of Mars, Phobos has a brightness of minus six magnitude, which is, if it was on Earth, brighter than anything except for the moon and the sun, so it's extremely bright. And that brightness is entirely a result of its proximity to the surface, because Phobos is actually one of the least reflective bodies in the solar system. Here's a view of the Martian night sky, and below the Milky Way and Orion, those two brightest dots are Phobos and Deimos, Mars's twin dwarf moons. So, in the last episode, we saw that large double planets can coexist without destroying each other, at least in the short term. But as peculiar as Phobos is, its effect on Mars is negligible. We're going to have to look elsewhere for double planets, if they do exist. Our own solar system is a small sample in a very large universe. So far, our methods for detecting exoplanets would have trouble detecting a pair of close orbiting double planets. However, according to some definitions, we do have double planets close to home, even if they're not as dramatic as the models we tested last episode. Isaac Asimov argued that the Earth and Moon should be considered a double planet, because the mass of the Moon is high enough that if it was away from Earth, it would clear its own orbit. It's this characteristic of a body massive enough that it becomes the only large object at that distance from the primary that gives us the best definition of a planet. If we look at our solar system this way, then there are a few objects that seem out of place. Our own moon, Neptune's moon Triton, and Pluto's companion Charon. In fact, these three all appear after their primary was in place, the Moon and Charon as a result of giant collisions, and Triton captured from a more distant orbit. Its reversed orbital course around Neptune is good evidence for this too. So double planets could form in those ways, through accretion after a collision, and by gravitational capture. The origin and composition of planets and moons have everything to do with how they behave. But here's where we come back to Phobos. In many cases, these systems would be unstable, either decaying or moving apart centrifugally, like our own moon. Now there's some disagreement about the internal structure of Phobos. We know it's less dense than many objects in the asteroid belt, and much less dense than Mars. This caused scientists in the 20th century to suggest that it might be full of ice, or even hollow. One of the leading theories is that it's a rubble pile, held together by a thin crust. However, we can't simulate that easily in Universe Sandbox, 
So, as we get close to Mars, it holds up surprisingly well. Well, let's just crash it into the surface for fun. <laughs> there we go. That is a cool explosion. Next time we'll look at binary stars, which, like double planets, are a dynamic part of certain stellar evolutionary stories. Until then, thanks for joining me, be excellent to each other, and keep exploring.